Welcome to Flipping the Table. Today, Michael speaks with Rick Clark, a central character in the documentary Common Ground, now screening across the nation. You may remember Michael's conversation last October with the directors of that film, Josh and Rebecca Tickell. Rick is featured in Common Ground because he cracked the code for large-scale regenerative farming, something essential if we hope to see a transformation of our food system. In their conversation, Rick describes the difference between an organic farm and a regenerative organic farm. And they end with an exploration of how regenerative agriculture could help to overcome the cultural and political divide separating the liberal coasts from the conservative heartland. Enjoy the show. Today, in this first episode of 2024, I continue to focus on the information and the people that have inspired and moved me through Common Ground, the amazing documentary now out across the nation in special screenings. You can find a screening near you by going online to commongroundfilm.org. That is commongroundfilm.org. One of the most compelling segments of the film features my guest today, Rick Clark. He is a corn, soy, and cattle producer from the heartland of Indiana. He has done what for years many said was impossible. He farms thousands of acres in a way that heals the earth and our bodies, and he makes more money doing it. In our capitalist system, which requires viable businesses to produce our food, his example is necessary. That is to say, it is required if we hope to achieve a truly healthy and resilient food system. Rick is a fifth generation farmer from Warren County, Indiana. He has won numerous awards, testified before Congress, and consults with farmers across the nation, sharing what and how he does all of it on his farm. He has credibility because for decades he farmed conventionally until he had his aha moment during a rainstorm that was taking away his soil, an experience that ignited his journey toward regenerative and organic farming. What I love about Rick is that he is not trapped by the past or his political party or his worldview as so many on both the political left and right are. He is a practical realist who loves his family and simply wants to create a better world, one where farmers and ranchers can produce the food we need in ways that enhance the land and our health and the rural economies that have been devastated by the industrial approach that emerged during the period after World War II. I respect and I like Rick, and I believe you will too as you listen to how we share common ground despite our currently polarized world. Let's begin. Rick Clark, fantastic. Great to see you here on Zoom. Uh, You're in Indiana. I'm here in California. So how are you today? Oh, Michael, I'm doing great. Last time we saw each other was Washington, D.C. For the absolute, I think it's a spectacular movie, Common Ground. But yeah, doing great, Michael. Doing great. Good. I mean, that's how we met Common Ground. You are one of the stars of Common Ground. Our audience knows we we uh, actually did a really great podcast with Josh and Rebecca. Oh, good. And uh, you are actually the first person from that who's kind of in the cast, so to speak, a documentary, but uh, in the cast. And then we're going to do something uh, with Stacy later about what she's doing up in North Dakota. So we always begin with uh, our guests talking about their origins. How did you come to be the farmer on your property? It's like most farms in the Midwest and probably probably around the world. I don't know that for sure, but there has to be a transition period and there has to be a period of when the next generation is going to at least step in and start to take over. Well, Michael, it just so happened that at the time when this was getting ready to go down, we had a cataclysmic weather event which created erosion, which then is what woke me up to say enough is enough. We've got to make a change. And then basically dad wanted to see one year and when dad saw the one year he said son it's it's let let it let her rip it's i see what i see how good this is and then it just started so it was a really good timing event well that's amazing and do you have siblings or were you like the natural guy to take over 
No, I have siblings, but uh, my oldest brother, I'm the youngest of four boys. Okay. So you can only imagine what mischief we, we would get into. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but the youngest of four boys, and and uh, sadly to say, my oldest brother uh, passed away from a massive heart attack, mm. and that, I mean, Michael, there's so many things going on here. I mean, I don't know how deep we want to go, but I always want to go deep. I I have always strived for soil health, okay, but when you stop and look at your family and what grief you've had in your family, you start to look at this from a human health aspect. And I mean, I know people talk about human health as dense, uh, increasing the nutrient density. I, I totally agree. That's one half of it. The other half is protecting us, the people that are on this farm and eliminating these, these caustic herbicides and pesticides. So that might right now where I am in my life, that's probably the biggest driver on the farm is maintaining Human health. Human health. But I kind of got away from your question, but the, the point here is it all was kind of happening as it needed to happen. Okay. So then I was the next, my other two siblings are gone. So my oldest brother is, is it, he's passed away. I'm there. I'm the only one left. So it was a natural fit. It's like everything I talk about when I, when I, when I speak in public, I think it's extremely important that if you're going to try something new, like like regenerative or whatever you want to call it, Mike, I don't I don't know what you even want to call it right at the at the beginning stages, but whatever that is, transition. You have to have success the first time you try something, or you're not going to come back. And I couldn't tell, Michael, I couldn't. The, the amount of success we had on the first the first swing at this was knocked it out of the park. That's what really got me hooked and and got me so entrenched in how do I get the farm there as fast as we can, but yet not wreck it and, and, and drive us into bankruptcy. Yeah, that's interesting. And Will Harris down at uh, uh, White Oak Pastures had a yeah. little bit different. I mean, he family transitioned again, but he, it was hard for him. He had a hard time doing it. Yeah, One of the things that really struck me about your story in the film is how successful it was and how how uh, the timing worked so beautifully. And yeah. also the fact that your wife talked about the health problems. I mean, her family, yeah. there was cancer. She had cancer. Those things have, were all in the mix, it seems, to awaken you to another approach or open you to pursuing right. another approach. When you leave the world of of mass destruction to the soil, high fertility, high inputs, blah, you know, all this stacked up. And the ultimate goal here is yield. Okay, that's what the farmers are working toward is we've got to maximize yield. Well, when you step out of that arena and start to understand that there is more to this than yield, it's more about being a good steward to the land, it's about being conservation minded, it's about building soil health, human health, all of these things, you no longer worry about yield, at least I don't. And this becomes- That just happens. That just happens. It just happens. And then, and you know, Michael, it's the same thing. I don't care. There's gotta be a term for this, but it's the same old thing. Once you get a feel for this, everybody says the same thing. Why didn't I do this 10 years ago? It's always the same response. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand and figure out how to move this message to the masses to the folks that don't quite understand. They drive by one of our fields and they're, and they're just thinking, what is this crazy guy up to? What's going on out here? And it's just so different, so. Yeah, we're gonna um, get to that. I wanna get to that question about yeah. how. Before we do that though, I want people to understand how you're farming. You have Clark Land and Cattle Company, so it, it talks about cattle too. So I'm interested in the relationship to animals and the yeah. crop systems you do. You do a beautiful job in the film of describing how you farm. Some people may not see the film, so I want them to hear from yeah. you what you're doing about the size of your farm, because that's the other big thing. In the minds of many, you are a very large farmer, and you were yeah. able to make this transition. I'm not built like that, but but when people people say, Rick, when you when you give a presentation, you've got to to quantify the amount of acres and. I, the amount of acres you've I'm like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't like doing it. No, but they're like, no, you don't understand. The, the, the acres that you farm makes it like, whoa, wait a minute. You mean, we're not just doing this on a one acre plot. 
you're doing this on on almost seven thousand acres so i understand that i don't that's like bragging but i don't think it's bragging because it's more of of explaining the journey and i get that you got the and the possibility it, it points to the possibility yeah what could happen yeah and i get it so let's go back to that to that timing of when the yeah. the farm was changing uh, leadership, let's call it. Was that 10 or 12 years ago? That was about, uh, that was 16 years ago. 16 years ago, okay. Okay, we had, we had done our normal procedures for farming, which was tillage, 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 and more tillage. And then we were ready to plant corn in the spring of 07, and we had a one inch rain event on a 1% slope field. So Michael, this is like looking at your tabletop. I mean, you couldn't tell zero from 1% if you were standing in the field. That's how minimal this is. And we had a one inch rain event and the soil moved from the field to the ditch to the road. And I'm like, no, this, this is it. This is, we're done, that we're not doing this anymore. So I started researching. I came up with my best guess because I didn't have a lot of people to talk to. So we went with one species, which I'll just tell you what it was. It was a tillage radish. And I went with a tillage radish for many reasons. And here they are, it has a very deep, tap root four or five feet deep goes into the profile so that's going to help mitigate compaction it has a an ability to scavenge nutrients and bring them to the surface and puts them in a in a tuber a, 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 a radish tuber i mean it's like three yeah. or four inches long by six eight inches or i mean three or four inches diameter by six or eight inches long or depending on the growth but that's typically where they wind up and then all these nutrients that they sequestered are stored in this tuber and then it dies and releases them all back into the profile. Okay. The other important thing here is it winter kills. So there's nothing for us to worry about next spring. So we took a field and, and I hope, I hope anybody that's listening, I, I hope I can get this. This is the way I think it should be done. Took a 200 acre field and we cut it in half. So whatever, I don't know, if you got a 40 or a 20 or whatever, cut it in half, try it this way and half of it this way and half of it your old, the way you're currently doing it. And then do not look at the yield at the end of the year, look at the return on your investment at the end of the year, because we're already saving money on tillage. Mm -hmm. So I think in the movie, I think this, this scene made it, but, um, uh, not only was it the best yielding cornfield we had, but it was the best ROI we had. Yeah, you're driving by the field looking at it when you yeah. say that. Yeah. I mean, Michael, I'm in. I mean, what what can we do now? What how do we how do we move and not jeopardize the farm here? So I, I and I don't know why these things happen. I can't explain. I just got a notion one day that we need to start testing these cover crops and see what nutrients are in the above ground material. Don't know what, I honestly don't know what made me think of this. So we started to do this. And when I got the first test back, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You're telling me that 12 inch rye has 80 pounds of nitrogen in it. And I'm like, this is, this is nuts. So we then set up a protocol to start monitoring the rye at certain growth stages. And then I have a chart in my presentations that people can go online and look up, but this chart will show you the power of sequestration that cereal rye has. So now when we started with cover crops, it was for a defensive mechanism, erosion. Mm -hmm. Now, when I realize the power they have, they are an offensive juggernaut. And so then because of this, we started to work with our agronomist and we started reducing inputs on specific fields and monitoring those fields to see if the fertility levels changed and if the yield levels changed. So you were using the, the plants to build their nitrogen content, the breakdown exactly. of the plants, basically. Exactly. And now the other thing I have to put in here is, you know, Mother Nature has absolutely guided me where to go this whole journey. I mean, there were points in this journey, Michael, where I got a little, a little probably overzealous a little bit and mother nature or God said, you know what, Rick, we're going to humble you this time. And you're going to have to learn how to take six, you know, six weeks of rain because you think you're going to go out and plant corn into cereal rye and just make this easy. We're not going to make it easy on you. You're going to get six inches of rain and then we're going to see how you can deal with this. 
Mm. And because of events like this is the only reason why I got so, I don't want to use reckless isn't the right word, but, but I got so creative with how we were going to push these, these uh, cover crops to their maximum. Mm. And that's, that's why we're here today mm. is because of those three or four particular events that happened on this journey that I said, wow. They gave can't. you direction. They kind of taught you lessons and sent you yeah. in a, uh, uh, they, they taught you how to, to work with the land. That's right. And we can do this, even though, and I'm, I don't want to put anybody down, but even though certain publications at the time were, were writing articles about, you cannot plant corn into Sir Rye, it does not work. Well, I would agree with that until you understand what's happening. And that's what these charts provide. Once you understand that the cereal rye is sequestering all of the nutrients that are available, and you now need to move nitrogen fur into the front part of your program, not the middle or back, then you can overcome what this rye is doing. Now, I do agree. I think there is an allopathy taking place here, but I think the greater obstacle is the fact that the rye will sequester so many nutrients. I mean, Michael, when you get to almost mature rye, you're pushing upwards of 150 pounds of nitrogen is in that above ground material. That's a lot of nitrogen. And so then if you, if you agree with what I'm saying and you buy into it, now let me tell you the other half of the equation here. If you come to our farm in the spring, you're not gonna see very many broadleaf weeds because of the same thing that's happening, what I just described. Yeah. The rye is sequestering those nutrients and storing them, and that young little giant ragweed or, or water hemp or whatever that weed is, has germinated, and now not only is the rye sequestering nutrients, but it's now growing and taking the sunlight and shading the ground, that weed is over. It germinates, grows two inches, and dies. So that, that it's so imperative that we figure out a way to teach people to, to implement these cover crops because right now, if you, you know, follow me, my timeline here, Michael. So we've planted, we've got the cover crop going in spring. We're going into it in April. We're no tilling beans in. We're rolling this down in June and it's now July 19th and the beans are this tall and there's been no reason to spray any chemicals up to this point. That's amazing. So, and people should just understand because in the film, it's clear because you show the machine that you roll yeah. with, you show how you drill the seed in, but tell people about those two things because they're not yeah. seeing. Yeah, so what, okay, so let me back up here. So I opened up a magazine and I saw this, this ad for an event that's going down in University of Wisconsin at Madison, okay? And it's being put on by a professor, her name's Dr. Aaron Silva. This is what the headline said. Come to Madison, Wisconsin and learn how to plant beans into a cereal riot boot stage and four weeks later roll it all down with a roller crimper. And I yeah. said, you're gonna do what? And so I got in my car and I drove to Madison, Wisconsin and there were about 30 other farmers there and Aaron taught us how to plant soybeans into cereal rye at a growth stage called boot stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's back up. So in the previous fall, we've harvested a corn crop, let's say, the corn's off, we come in with our no-till drill and we drilled 100 pounds of Elbon cereal rye and if we had enough time in the growing seed, season, You're talking about the seed gets drilled into the ground. Okay. Yeah, the seed is called Elbon cereal rye. There's many varieties, but we just use Elbon. And if you have time in the fall for diversity, you've got to get it into your cocktail at that point. But if you don't have time, then you just plant a, a, a monoculture of, of cereal rye. Okay, so the monoculture or the, the, the cereal rye is planted. It maybe will germinate. It might, it depends on what time of the year this is. And then it'll go into dormancy, come out of dormancy next spring and start to grow. And when it gets to boot stage, we pull in with our either our, our corn planter and we plant or we pull in with our, our no-till drill, which is the same tool that we used in the fall to plant the, cover, the, the cereal rye, okay? Pull in, plant your soybeans at boot stage. Then in about 40 days, so typically for Midwest uh, Indiana where we are, boots, and it's not a, t it's not a date thing, Michael, that's a growth stage thing, but I'm right, just- Right, 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 how long it takes, yep. 
Fall parking is April 25th, okay? So we're pulling in the field, we're planting beans, and then again, ballpark for anthesis, which is when it's dropping pollen. And, and the reason why this works is because the, the lignin in the plant, in the stalk is at the highest point here and it becomes very brittle. So then we pull in with the, the, um, the roller crimper, the INJ ro uh, roller crimper. Which rolls and along and the, knocks the grass down, right? It rolls the beans and the, beans the rye down, rolls everything flat. The rye stays down and the beans stand back up. And here we go. So now at this point, Michael, we have done nothing other than spend about $35 an acre for this cover crop package. And we have not sprayed the first chemical and we've not applied the first fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so now we have you, low cost input. Yeah. And we need to come back to that. I, I talked a little bit about the power that the cover crops have, but I need to also tell you what that translates into. And we'll get to that in a minute. So now it's, it's, June, whatever, whatever, June 25th to, to uh, July 2nd, okay? You've got a time period here where now your beans are probably about this tall, well, maybe a little taller. So depending on if you, uh, if you rode them in, in 20 inch rows or 30 inch rows, or did you put them in seven and a half inch rows? Because the reason why I'm explaining this is because I have a 70-30 rule. So 70% of the weed suppression is happening with that cover crop that we rolled flat, okay? Because it, it's now armored the soil and it is totally shielding the sunlight from hitting the ground. Because once the sunlight hits soil, weeds are gonna germinate and here we go. Okay, so 70% of weed suppression is with that cover crop. Now the other 30% of suppression is with the cash crop canopy. Uh -huh. So if we're on seven and a half inch spacing, you get to canopy way quicker than you do 20 inch row spacing. Okay? So you do that. You do seven inches. Yeah, we'll, we'll do seven. We'll do 20. Those are our two, our two distances. Okay. So now, like I said, it's, it's July 1st approximately, and we've spent no money and we have sprayed no chemicals to get us to July 1st. Mm -hmm. Now, I often say, or no, I always say, and I'll even, I'm going to say it here on your podcast, Michael, I never force the way we farm down anybody's throat. That's not what I'm about. I am about teaching you ways of our journey that hopefully you can take one or two or three of our concepts, take them home to your farm, start implementing them on your farm until you get comfortable and then you decide how far you want to take it. So I'm way over here where I've taken everything away mm -hmm. and the rest of the world is way over here. That's, that's, that's either getting started or has done nothing. There's somewhere where we can meet right here in the middle and figure out how to start being so dependent on synthetic inputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what my goal is, is to get people to get away from doing nothing and start doing something. Now, if you want to come all the way and take it all away, I'll be more than happy to help show you. I'm totally transparent with everything we do on this farm. And it's, it's a very, you know, pay for Michael, this is hard. Yeah. You're fun. organic. And what you're saying is that there's a conventional world out there that what, what we would call conventional production agriculture, and mm -hmm. you're trying to get them to start a journey to kind of just get in the middle. So they have the comfort of those tools that they know well, that make them feel safe, protect them in a certain way. Um, right. But you're willing to go all the way with someone if they want to make that big jump. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I think this is very important. I think we've got to go easy here because we cannot jeopardize the livelihood of the farm. You, we cannot right. implement something that's going to say, oh, wow, it was a, whatever Rick suggested. It was a it was a bomb on the whole farm and I'm out of business now. No, that is what we cannot have happen here. Right. I get it. Totally get it. So now in your operation, you get it all the way to harvest. Yeah. Yeah, it depends. So in that scenario that I laid out to you right then, we have rolled this cereal grain down and it's no longer a viable prop crop for us. Okay. Right. It is merely a cover crop now that's suppressing weeds. That's all it's doing. Now we do have situations where we will not roll that crop down and we will let the beans or the peas 
grow with that cereal grain because I want the synergy of what those two crops do for each other and they grow all the way to maturity and then we harvest the two together and then we separate them at, at, at the farm with the cleaner. And we're yeah. actually doing that right now. At the farm, the guys have got the cleaner going and we are separating wheat and rye from soybeans. How interesting, I've never heard of that. Yeah, so I'm a huge believer of diversity. Diversity yeah. is probably your number one advantage that we can have to be successful here. So when I look at diversity, uh, too many times people look at diversity as just being, you know, you used to use one or two species in your cover crop, let's go up to six or seven. Well, I don't disagree, that's diversity, but there's other ways to look at it. How about cash crop commingling to become- That, that is fascinating. And yeah. one of the arguments I always here is that, oh, you can't go for monocropping to this diverse thing because you can't put these crops together, but you're in fact doing it. You can, you can. As a matter of fact, you could put Milo with soybeans, you could put corn with soybeans, uh, you could put faba beans with corn. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to look at this that and if I if I really sat down and thought about it, we could probably come up with four or five other combinations. This is the future, Michael. I, these monocultures are not gonna succeed. And right. we have to also think about the cover crop as being a monoculture. Like when I told you earlier that we're going out and planting 100 pounds of Elbon rye, that's not desirable, Michael, because that's a monoculture. Yeah, I get it. So if you have time in the fall to plant a cold, I mean, a, a species that will winter kill, like a cow peas or a radish or sorghum sudan or sunflower, these species will winter kill. If you've got time in the fall to add those to that 100 pounds of Elbon rye, then they all grow together. Those four or five die off and, the, and all you're left with next spring is the rye. Mm -hmm. That's where we've got to get to. We hope you're enjoying the conversation. If you are, please rate our podcast and offer a review. Your voice will help us grow our listener base, which helps us sustain the funding to share these conversations with the people and organizations shaping a more just and regenerative future. A future in which the food and farm businesses are helping to solve the largest challenges of our time. I want to ask you a little bit about animals. Do you bring animals in in between crops in a rotation? We do, but I'll be I'll be brutally honest, Michael. We do not have enough people on the farm right now. Really? I need help. I need and I need more animals. But yes, where where we have infrastructure, so meaning where we have fence built and where we have water, right. we, we will bring cattle in. And, and I'm gonna tell you right now, sometimes the best cattle to have are not yours. There's somebody in your area that right. you go talk to them and you say, hey, Bob, you know what? I got a 200 acre field here. Let's bring, can I, can I bring a hundred of your replacement heifers in and let, we're gonna rotationally graze them across and in 60 days, you'll have them back and you pay me either a daily fee or a rate of gain. And Bob says, you know what? That'd be awesome. Let's do it. So we're benefiting Bob and we're benefiting the farm. And That's great, that's animals. beautiful. Do you yeah. think there uh, are people talking about that approach? Yeah, Are you yeah. and I think the biggest, the number one biggest place to go are either feedlots or dairies. I think like all these replacement heifers that are coming back to the dairy, bring them to a regenerative home, let them let them grow. You know, they're, they're gonna be weaned off. Let's say they're they're six or seven months old or eight months old. They've been weaned, so now they've been, they're established. Now you bring them to your farm, you run them for 60 days and you hand them back in. And now they've got a healthy cow that's put on, I don't know, a pound and a half or two pounds a day, a rate of gain. And, and they're almost a mama cow now ready to come into the milking herd. So that's how, that's how I like to look at it. Yeah, well, you know, um, I just want to say that it's beautiful the way you're describing how you can diversify the actual cash crop. You can you can integrate animals, and there's a system that needs to develop further. It's it's yeah. just in the emergent stage where yeah. you are, and that's really important that it's starting and that you can see a pathway. I just want to talk about one of the things that really comes out in the film is that this has been profitable for you. You've actually yeah. made more money moving into this world versus the old world. Yeah. 
and I'm going to answer this in kind of a long-winded answer, but I want to go back okay. to the cover crops, okay? And then I'm going to build up to your to your question. I talked about how when we started, the cover crops were viewed as defense. Mm -hmm. Then once we got into it and we started testing, we identified how powerful the cover crops are. For bringing so, nutrients to the soil. Yeah, you were, this is my definition of regenerating. I mean, we are pulling nutrients from deep within the profile back to the surface through the plants. The plants are terminated. The microbes consume the plants and regenerate those nutrients back into the profile. Right. This, to me, this is perfect. This right. is what it's about. It's a circle like that. Okay. So then I said to my agronomist, I said, you know, these cover crops are powerful. And I've only talked, and Michael, we've only talked about uh, cereal grains. We haven't even talked about legumes yet. But anyway, these cover crops are powerful. Here's what I want to do. I want you to give me the farm's recommendation for fertility. Okay, because we're this is the game we're still in. This is way back at the beginning here, Michael. So I want you to give me the recommendations for the fertility plan for the farm. And when you do, I'm going to pick out two fields and I'm going to take your recommendations and we're going to cut them in half. And then we're going to farm the same way we've been farming, except we've now got cover crops on these two fields. Okay, we go through the season, raise our crops, harvest the crops. The yield's exactly the same. We, we pull a soil sample, and I, I got to back up, I forgot. We baselined our farm. So before we started this, we pulled soil samples on every acre, and we baselined the farm, okay? Because you got to know if what you're doing is right or not. Right. So then we went through the first year of 50% reduction, and yields were the same. We pulled another soil test, and guess what? Fertility was the same. So we went into year two, did the same thing, 50% reduction, same results. So I said, okay, fine. 50% reduction in nitrogen and, and, and phosphorus, right? Everything. Okay. NPK, chemistry, everything. 50% reduction of all inputs across the board. Because I needed to see if this is going to be real or not. Right. So then those 200 acres, or, or those two, yeah, it was two fields. I don't remember the acres, but it was two fields. Now year one's done, year two's done. They're over here now, no more inputs. We're done. Those are gone. We now pull 500 acres in and do the same thing. Give me your, give me your, your recommendation, 50% reduction. I did it for one year. I saw no yield change. If, if anything, we might have seen a yield increase and we saw no fertility changes in soil test. I'm done. What, I, what's I'm your done. is saying when he's seeing the results? Is he like, Jesus, what have I been telling people to do? Yeah, he's he's thinking like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. What what's happening here? What how can this be? I've got my formulas from college that say when you take this much yield off, you got to put this much potash back or whatever it is. And we were not seeing that. We were seeing that levels were staying the same. There's two choices here. The first choice is what a lot of naysayers want to say is, well, Rick, you're living off of the fertility bank that your ancestors put out there for you. Okay, maybe. I don't know. I don't have enough information yet to say yes or no. Number two is the cover crops are really doing something here that we haven't realized. So I'm going to go with the cover crop notion. Mm -hmm. So now, Michael, we've completed the third year of this and to some people, this may not sound like a good enough trial, but I had, I had three parts that were repeat. And I said, I'm done. We're now going to take the whole farm and start reducing inputs all the way down as far as we can. So you, your theory was proved enough for you to, to bet the farm. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Calculated risk is what I like right. to call that. Right. So now when you start to pull the inputs away and you remember earlier i talked about how yield isn't even part of this thinking process and it's not anymore now your brain is thinking how far can we take this and be a farmer with z with no inputs how far can we go can we go 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent i you know i don't know but here's where i've got to caution the audience context is extremely important here where are you in the world, okay? The soils in Arizona and New Mexico are way more fragile than they are right. in Midwest, okay? Right. 
Can we expect the soils in, in Arizona and New Mexico to totally eliminate inputs? Probably not. Right. But we can sure do a massive reduction of probably 40 or 50%. Mm -hmm. And just, that's huge. If we were just, if we could across the board reduce synthetic fertilizer by 50%, Michael, that would be huge to the, to the farmer's pocketbook. Huge. Right. And also uh, be a lot less uh, natural uh, gas burn to create that nitrogen. That's right. And less runoff into the creeks yep. and streams. Right. The algae bloom maybe starts getting smaller in the Gulf of Mexico instead of bigger. Right. I mean, I just read an article the other day from the Chesapeake. They have now seen that the the uh, algae bloom in the bay is actually shrinking now. It may have may have said that it was almost gone now that I think about the article because it's been shrinking. It may actually almost be gone now. Good. So it's proven that not only can the farmers be profitable in doing this, but we can now save the natural resources. Yep, that's beautiful. So all that less input got you, because I want to switch the topic here soon to talking about regenerative agriculture and uh, the future of the country in a certain way. So let's get to the end of the story about your full transition and the fact that you are now kind of living proof that this is a profitable thing to do. Yeah. Let me tell you when the farm was absolutely maximizing return on investment. Okay. This is the, this is the scenario right here. And again, folks, I'm from Midwest, Indiana. Uh, most people know where Champaign, Illinois is come right across from Champaign, Illinois and the state line. I'm right there. So context is important here. So this is where we were knocking it out of the park. We were hundred percent cover crop. 100% no-till, 100% non-GMO, and we were 70% reduction of inputs. So we were not organic yet, okay? That's the scenario that we were, we were actually increasing yield every year on both corn and beans, and we were down to a 70% reduction of inputs. So we were becoming extremely profitable. This and what year, how long did it take you to get to that? You said you started in 2007, when did you get to there? That got, we got to there like in uh, 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. Okay. Took okay. you 16 years. Okay. Yeah. And when we got to that point, we were the most profitable per acre we've ever been. I mean, Michael, some of our, some of our percentage of, of ROI gains were a hundred percent. Some of them, a lot of them were in the thirties and 40% gains of, of, of profitability. Okay. That's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. So then I've already told, I've got this all out of whack, but it's okay. Then I had the conference that I went to in Michigan or in Wisconsin and Dr. Aaron Silva taught me how to do, and me and other farmers taught me how to do farming with a roller crimper. Then when we started doing that, Michael, then I said, why aren't we organic? Because we have now eliminated all chemistry in soybean production. We took it all away. So that's when I got the, the courage because that roller crimper was the segue into organic no-till farming. Yeah. I gotta stress that here. Yeah. There's a lot of organic farms out there that are high tillage yeah. and they're not building soil health. Right. We are trying to do this with no tillage, organic, all cover crop and scale. That, so that's an important thing you said there because that you know, people argue about regenerative versus organic. Oh, organic is better. Why Why are we doing regenerative? Well, you just explained sometimes organic agriculture is actually not doing That's what right. you're saying, right? That's right. I mean, we have to know what the principles of soil health are. Number one is min minimize disturbance. And that means two things, disturbance of chemistry and disturbance of tillage. Right. We have to stop tillage to let the microbial biome build itself up and maximize what it's doing for your system. We're done. We no more, no more seed treatments, no more. I mean, this is nine years ago. No more seed treatments, no more uh, insecticides, no pesticides, no, pesticides, no more chemistry, no more P, no more K. Nine years, I mean, going in in just a few weeks here, we're going to be in 24 and I can safely say 10 years now, we've not done any of these things. And uh, is our system perfect? No way. And if I ever tell you that it is perfect, uh, slap me across the face because nothing is ever perfect. You should right. always be in the mindset that you need to make it better than it is currently. And then you just keep trying to improve the system that you have.
the weather. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what. So you're kind of like riding the big waves as a surfer, yeah. trying to get, you know, the system to, to stay in balance and work. And that's another point that I like to bring up. Thank you for reminding us. When you work, when you farm the way we're trying to do it, Michael, we don't have all those dollars that you have to borrow at the bank. They're not at risk yet because nothing's put out there. Where the conventional farmer, they've gone to the bank, they've borrowed, I don't know, $800, $900 an acre, and all that money, and sometimes it'd be more than that, uh, if you put in a corn crop with high cash rate, you're gonna get to $1,400 an acre of an investment that you borrow probably money. had to borrow that money, and that money is totally at risk by June the 1st. Mm -hmm. So now you are totally dependent on mother nature and what weather is she going to deal you the rest of the growing season and to right me, now with all the the chaos in the weather it's scary that's risky that that is high risk and that's what we want to avoid in the film there are a lot of really great stories but the story yeah. that i felt was most compelling that could could really transform the situation in the united states was your story because okay. it was scale and it was a journey that you took and uh, you're in the heart of really conventional agriculture is the way right. we think about it, commodity agriculture. You're in the heart of it. And right. you made this transition successfully. And now you're out talking to others about it. And when you and I met, one of the questions that came up in the, af the talk afterwards, after we showed the film, screened the film in, in D.C., in an audience conversation, you were sitting in the front row because you had done the night before on the panel. Mm -hmm. And this question about the country came up and about the pol politics of the country. And you made a really good statement about the need to get the politicians to basically work together. Yeah. We have this huge problem in the United States with the coasts and the central part of the country. The heartland and the coasts have been at odds. You see it in the politics. I have a theory. I have a theory that for too many years in this country, the kind of political and financial elites on the coasts and the political and financial elites in the Midwest thought too much about the corporations and the way to keep the money flowing to the people that it was flowing to. And what happened is the Midwest got hurt badly. I mean, it's not just the Midwest. We have it here in California, but the Midwest is the heartland and it's where most of the agriculture is. And yeah. you guys have the highest rates of cancer. The cities have shrunk down because they're being de depopulated because all the wealth is being concentrated by fewer and fewer companies. And you guys got hurt. This is my theory. Am I seeing it wrong? No, not at all. I'll tell you what really woke, woke me up, Michael, was when I testified. I was absolutely honored to be testified. Before uh, the, the USDA, uh, the Congress, before the House, House yeah, Committee. I was, I was at the, the, the inaugural regenerative economic uh, hearing I was part of. Right, they, I remember. Yep. Chairman Scott contacted me, asked me to testify personally. So, I mean, I could I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. So, what I couldn't believe was even more so was when I got there. Okay, I thought, and naive Rick here, you know, farmer from Midwest. I mean, of all committees in Congress, don't you think the ag the ag folks are going to be the ones that'll get together? And they're gonna they're not gonna have a, an aisle down the middle. They're all gonna just kind of come in and be friendly and be open minded. And hey, we're you know what Republicans we're gonna hammer this out. Yes, Democrats we're gonna hammer this out. And I got in there and it was the exact opposite of that. And I thought there's something wrong. There's something wrong here. So it started out a little uh, chippy at the beginning, but then everything settled down and then we started to see eye to eye on this. But yes, Michael, we have got to, we've got to break these barriers down and we've got to understand that sometimes the, the financing that is, is behind a lot of these projects is not the best kind of financing for the end goal of what we're trying to get to. And we have to understand that it's going to take a tremendous amount of teaching for this to happen. So in my opinion, the next push for this regenerative movement to take the next level higher is education. And that's not only educating the, the, the bureaucratic system and the folks that are in it, but it's also educating the farmers that don't have any idea what we're talking about. They may want to change, but they don't know how to start. So we have to show them how to do that. You know, and I always kind of make a funny analogy about this because I've done a lot of traveling in my life 
When you climb into an elevator in the Midwest, you can say hi and have a conversation with anyone in that elevator. And there won't be any, any feelings of anything. You get on either coast and climb in an elevator and you mention a word to somebody, they're crawling into the corner of the elevator seeing how far they can get away from you. It's just not Midwest hospitality like it is in the Midwest. And I think that's, that may seem silly, but no. I think that's part of our problem here. Yeah, it's a cultural thing, right? I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I see it. I, I understand that. And if we could get the politics out, first of all, I love the idea. I love the the term heartland. Mm -hmm. I think it's a beautiful term. Yeah, and it is the heartland of the country. And there's so much history. You know, it's 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 rich, and it's also where we've gotten so much of the wealth of the country from the Midwest. But a lot of that wealth is transferred to New York City and LA and San Francisco and Chicago. And it's not really in those communities anymore. It's like the Central Valley of California. When I was a kid, it was beautiful and all the towns were healthy. Now they're freaking ghost towns, basically. This, yeah. They've all shrunk down to these little things because all the money's getting taken out. And yeah. I think what you're doing, you are demonstrated that you can keep the wealth in your property, you don't have to send it to a chemical company or a seed company. Well, you have to buy seed. You don't have to send it to no, chemical companies. No, buy you buy seed the machinery, you go through a transition, and then you're keeping the wealth. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. The money is staying in. And not only is it staying within our farm, but we're also, we also pump it back into our local communities. So it's just a win, win, win. I mean, it's just... I really am proud of this this common ground movie. Not that not that we're in it. That's not why I'm saying this. I mean, Michael, when you, you go to a premiere and you look around the audience, what's the age? You see a lot of 20 somethings in that audience. And everywhere I've been, the 20 somethings are in the front row and they're the first ones to raise their hand and ask a question to the Q and A panel. Right. That is exciting to me. Yeah, in That's, D.C. it happened. It happened in D.C. African-American yeah. girl got up who was uh, working and wanted to be a farmer. That yep. was fantastic. It's, it's, that's exciting. That, to me, and then you like the word heartland, which I do too, and you're going to like this word also. This is a grassroots movement, and that's what this is. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it is exciting, and I would love to get a group of people from your community to communicate with a group of people from my community mm -hmm. and have like a larger Zoom conference yeah. and talk about what we actually have in common, not the things that separate us. Yeah. Well, I'm very fortunate. I've done a lot of consulting and I actually was on, it was a year ago, I had about 50 farmers from the uh, Central Valley on and, and we had a consultation of, with 50 guys. And I'm gonna tell you right, I'll just go ahead and say it all. It was uh, Jeff Mitchell at UC Davis. Uh -huh. and he's the one who put it together. So you gotta give, I mean, that takes courage. And that right there, I mean, Jeff is extension. So he's outreaching through the extension and we had 50 farmers on. And, uh, you know, did we do some good? I think we did some, but there's a long way to go in Central Valley. And, and everything there is dependent on water. Right. And the water's running out. Right. That's right. So, uh, and, you know, the other thing is, I mean, farmer to farmer is really important like you've been doing. But I want to get bot consumers to yeah. talk to the farmers of the Midwest. Yeah. Because there are all kinds of... Um, beliefs about farmers in the Midwest, some of which is true and some of which is not. And yeah. you break the mold and it's really, I, I really want to do this. I want to get some people to talk to you who are like consumers and investors and, and activists and um, environmentalists. Out. Hey, the weather's pretty nice in, in Los Angeles or the California. <laughs> Just all come out, okay? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. We'll work on that. Um, yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Next year, you should come to Eco Farm. I don't know. Are you not coming this year? I'll bet. Uh, no, I, no I, I won't. No, not this year. Okay, but next year, I think it would be great for you to come to that and be one of the keynotes. Yeah. Great. Yeah, for when, you to do that. When is that, Michael? It's the third week of January. Yeah, we can make that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. The one thing I, I do want to say that I heard from you that was interesting, it took you basically 10 years to get to a place. It was signed, sealed, delivered. You were on the road. Yeah. And uh, and then you started to really spread the word, the, the good word in a, in a way. So when we look at the future, 
Let's say the United States government decided to really put up the resources to make the teaching happen that you think needs to happen. The coasts and the consumers are like saying, yes, let's have this happen. We don't have to think about the politics. Let's just think about the heartland and the food and the farms and the animals and the farmers and the people. How long would it take to transform the system? You're going to see change happen immediately. But the kind of change that we need to see to start pulling inputs away, three years. Uh -huh. So we've got to make sure, again, we've got to make sure everyone understands this. You know, okay, whoever the administration that's in the power at the time, okay, great. All right, you know what? We're, you know what? We're going to let you do, have your fun, and you're going to go out. But no, no, wait a minute. you got to understand, if you're going to let us go with this, this is a three-year project minimum. Then when we start to see that things can be regenerated and they're staying the same, then we start to pull inputs away because we cannot do this too quick. Because, Michael, once you start, if you know, if you start off the cliff, it's awfully hard to come back. Right. We can stop it. But once the fertility levels start crashing, it's very hard to get them to come back. And it's going to be very hard, almost impossible with just cover crops. It's going to take an outside source like manure or something like that, which opens up a whole nother can of worms. But, a whole nother can of worms. But, you know, I'm going to say three years minimum. Per farm. But not every farm in America is going to do that the same year. I think it's like a 20 year transition. At least. At least. So all the more reason to get everyone on board and agree, because no matter what administra an administration's in, it continues on. You don't want whatever. I'm just going to speak politics. Now, you don't want the Democratic people to get this in place and then the Republicans get power and take it all away. Right. That, that does none of us any good. Exactly. And, and I'll tell you what, Michael, I, you know, there are too many. Our society today is voting for that person because I don't like that person. Right. And right. then the right person is not in in the in the positions anymore. It's just um, and you know what? And I'm going to say one more thing and I'll get down off my box. But when I was growing up, Michael, we would never dare say anything bad about anyone in power. Yep. I know. It's tragic. It's tragic. You know, I think we're in agreement. We want to see a different way. We have a lot of common ground living in different places, probably different politics. But yeah. you know what? I really see a lot of common ground and I'm really grateful to you for what you've done, for your Thank participation you. in the film, for your what you've done with your farm and for talking to me today and our audience. So thank you, Rick. That's I'll awesome. be back in touch. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> thank you. Great job. Keep up the good work. Yeah, you too. Talk soon. All right, bye. bye bye. Thank you for listening. Roots of Change is a program of the Public Health Institute. 